Good morning, buenos dias. I hope you enjoyed those pet and summer photos as much as I did. I'm John Hernandez and I have the honor of serving as your president. And I wanna welcome you to fall convocation and to the opening session for our fall 2020 professional development week. I'd like to introduce the president of the South Orange County Community College District, TJ Prendergast. You had some semblance of a summer break and found a way to deal with the many uncertainties and changes that we've all experienced. In March, when we closed the campuses due to COVID-19, many of us thought we'd be returning this fall semester in person and kicking off the semester in our usual manner. Thanks to the heroic efforts of our faculty and staff, we have made major adjustments to bring everything online, greatly reducing the risk we face during this historic pandemic. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I wanna say that we clearly understand that this is a moment in which our imperatives to lead, innovate, and impact humanity are coming together for the future of our district. Our success, sorry, I had a message pop up. <laughs> Isn't that the way it always works? Uh, our success depends on all of us working together. Our challenge as a community is to ensure our mission endures. Serving the public good is more vital now than ever. Although we eagerly anticipate the day that we can reconvene in person, we are proud to partner with you in the efforts to remain safe and healthy while offering excellent education to our students. The Board of Trustees is here to support your efforts and want to know what your challenges are. Thank you for your continued commitment to students and have a great fall semester. Thank you, TJ, appreciate that. I'd also like to welcome all of our trustees, Vice President of the Board, Trustee Timothy Jamal, Clerk of the Board, Trustee James Wright, Trustee Terry Witt Riddle, Trustee David Lang, Trustee Marsha Milchifer, Trustee Barbara Jay, Student Trustee Ethan Manafi, and of course our Chancellor Kathleen Burke. At this time, we have some special pre recorded remarks from several of our board members. Welcome back. I am Trustee James R. Wright. Starting a new professional development week and the start of a new semester is here. With the COVID-19 pandemic going on and the colleges being shut down, this has been a challenging time. I know that the main purpose of the California Community Colleges is to provide students of all ages, from all cultures, and from all socioeconomic backgrounds have the opportunity to achieve their post secondary educational goals. To succeed requires two ingredients. An outstanding faculty and motivated students. Our South Orange County Community Colleges, Irvine Valley College and Saddleback College possess both. My 40 plus years as an educator have taught me this. To solve the challenges that we face takes leadership that is marked by goodwill, trust, respect, cooperation, and collaboration. I desire that our colleges continue providing quality education. Before concluding my remarks, I want to welcome Dr. John Hernandez, who began his tenure as president of Irvine Valley College on Thursday, July 30th, 2020. I also want to personally thank the president of Saddle 
Back College, Dr. Elliot Stern, for all the work he has done upon starting his time in January 2019. Again, my best to you for a great fall academic semester. Good morning, IBC professors, administrators, and staff. We welcome you to a new academic year and sincere welcome to IBC's new president, Dr. John Hernandez. I hope all of you were able to enjoy some interesting and restorative activities this summer. To those of you who are returning, we are grateful to you for your tenacity, perseverance, and endurance during these uncertain and unpredictable times. We are grateful to you for keeping our colleges going, even as everything shut down. We are grateful to you for your working tirelessly to change all of your classes to online classes in just one week. You have ensured that our students continue to receive an exceptional education, and I am so proud. For those who are new to IVC, we are delighted to have you join us. I thank you for embarking on this uncharted terrain to serve students who need us now more than ever. The mission of the South Orange County Community College District is rooted in service to our students and to our community. As the longest serving member of the Board of Trustees and a biology professor, I know that IBC's incredible commitment to our students is what has helped us get through every challenging interval in our district's history. I have continually been inspired by your strength and resilience. Although working through in the midst of a pandemic provides numerous uncertainties, I am confident of one thing. We will get through it together because we are IVC. Again, welcome back. And please know that your Board of Trustees supports your work and valiant efforts to maintain exemplary service to our students. You make all the difference. Best wishes for an extraordinary 2021 academic year and stay safe because we need you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to extend my greetings as a member of the board for all of you participating in Professional Development Week as we begin to welcome, welcome students back for fall semester. This year to date has certainly been a challenging adventure for all of us with no signs that the balance of the year will be no less interesting. The pandemic has caused all of us to develop new coping strategies and routines and will leave both scars and lasting behavioral impacts on our society. From an educational standpoint, it has certainly accelerated the trend towards remote learning, which I believe will change the face of students' educational experiences forever. We will need to be nimble in responding to these changes to meet the competitive challenges. I appreciate the job that our faculty and staff have done in preparing our two colleges for the immediate hurdles that we face to deliver a quality education experience to our students. As I approach the conclusion of my last board term, I want to thank all of you who have made my tenure on this board such a rewarding experience. I want to acknowledge incoming uh, Irvine Valley College President John Hernandez uh, and know that everyone at both colleges and the district will make him feel warmly welcome and his experience with our district will be a mutually fulfilling one. I also want to acknowledge Saddleback President Stern on the tremendous positive impact he has made on the college thus far. Be safe, good luck, and best w wishes to all of you on the road ahead. Hello, faculty and staff. Welcome back to what will be one of the most unique fall semesters in our district's history. As a member of the South Orange County Community College District Board of Trustees, I'd like to express my gratitude to all who had a hand in ensuring our successful transition to online learning. I'm additionally thankful for the efforts you made over the summer to prepare for a virtual learning experience that upholds the academic excellence that our students have grown accustomed to deserve. If you are new to South Orange County Community College District, welcome to an amazing district. 
We are proud of the buildings, the programs, but most of all, the people in our district. During these uncertain times, we know that you will continue to experience various challenges. But together, we can uplift each other throughout this semester to be our best and serve our students in the best possible way. Remember to take care of yourself, take care of your family, and remain positive. See you online soon. Thank you for those welcoming messages. I know that it's not possible to thank everyone attending in this virtual platform. I'm deeply touched by the tremendous turnout for this fall convocation, but there are some individuals in leadership roles that I would like to recognize. Academic Senate President Jean McLaughlin, Faculty Association President Louis Long, Classified Senate President Amy Hunter, ASG of IBC President Brianna Ross, IBC Foundation immediate past president Betty Jo Woolett, Vice Chancellor of Technology and Learning Services Bob Ramucci, Vice Chancellor of Human Resources Cindy Viscachel, Vice Chancellor of Business Services Anne Marie Gable, and Saddleback College President Edward Stern. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Chancellor of the South Orange County Community College District. My new boss, Kathleen Burke. Hello, everybody. Um, I have a little, a brief presentation as part of my greeting. Just waiting for it to come onto the screen. John, do you have it? Just say standby, John. Standby. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so as you know, as a historian, I like to take a look at the past. And one of the things I like to talk about every year is the mindset list. So this is these are a few things from the mindset list for students born in 2001. Because as you recall from when I've shown these to you before, the new mindset list comes out after we have opening day. So these are for our 19 year olds and certainly these items would fall with for the 18 year olds as well. So nearly half of them are composed of people of color. Two thirds of the generation identify exclusively, uh, only two thirds identify exclusively as heterosexual. They've probably all been gaslighted or ghosted and YouTube has become the video version of Wikipedia for them. So on to the next slide. <clears throat> so, like Pearl Harbor for their grandparents and the Kennedy assassination for their parents, 9-11 is a historical event for them. Uh, the majority of them were not alive when it happened. Uh, certainly that's true for our 18 year old incoming students. So as much as that is a feature of our lives who did witness it in person, uh, it is something they will learn about in the history books. Next slide. Uh, Apple iPods have always been nostalgic, and this is my own Apple iPod, my first one. So I must have trouble getting rid of things that I can't use anymore. Uh, the next slide. Oklahoma City has always had a national memorial at its center for the explosion. So the memorial was built before these young people were born. Next. The primary use of a phone rather than speaking on it has been to take pictures. And of course, we love to take pictures of food. Next slide. So it's been 19 years since we've had to take our shoes off when we got on a plane because of Richard Reed and his explosive footwear. So we all experience that regularly. Next slide, please. 
there has always been a, a Tokyo Disney Sea. Uh, of course, there's a Tokyo Disneyland, but there's also a Tokyo Disney Sea. And that opened in 2001. Next slide. For you baseball lovers or, or uh, fans of sports in general, Cal Ripken Jr. has always been retired. Uh, this one struck me, I do follow baseball, but also for those of you who, who follow it and who don't, of course, Carl Ripken is the Iron Man of baseball. Uh, he played 2,632 consecutive games, uh, beating the prior record, which had been held by Lou Gehrig at 2,130 games. And uh, Lou Gehrig's uh, streak was broken, of course, when he contracted ALS. Uh, and the next one. And of course, we never leave without something from the Beatles. Unfortunately, this one is. Uh, these, these students that we have have shared a world with only half of the Beatles. Of course, John Lennon was murdered in 1980. We'll be celebrating the or commemorating the 40th anniversary of his death. And George Harrison died of cancer in 2001. Now, a couple of things uh, that are older that none of us were here for likely, or a few of us were here for. 75 years ago, just this past uh, Thursday and Sunday, uh, we dropped the atomic bombs in Hiroshima. And then on Sunday, or Sunday for us this year, the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Uh, the pictures you see here that top picture is of the atomic dome. That building is at uh, ground zero for where the bomb was dropped. It, that's what remains of it. And I was struck by the explosion this week, this last week in Beirut. Uh, if you recall the grain cellar, that was a complete building at one moment and then left to rubble a few minutes later. And then at the bottom, you see some pictures from the Peace Park uh, and then the clock you see is marked at 8.16 a.m., which was when the bomb was dropped on a Monday morning. Uh, and that's the entrance to the museum at uh, Hiroshima. Uh, next slide. 400 years ago, a little over 400 years ago, we have the, the tale of two ships. Uh, the first one in 1619 was the White Lion, which anchored in Virginia and brought the first Africans as slaves to the United States. And then in stark contrast, on November 11th in 1620, uh, the Mayflower landed, bringing people to religious freedom. So the, that's a pretty stark contrast of our history. And I think we've seen a lot, particularly in the last few months, uh, as we continue to try and develop a more perfect union, uh, we must continue to strive to develop a more perfect union in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. And as part of that, and 100 years ago, we are celebrating the vote for women. Uh, we've only had the vote for 100 years and, and it was the passage of the 19th Amendment that prohibited states and the federal government from denying the right to vote on the basis of sex. So we have uh, the 19th Amendment in 1920, but in reality, uh, women of color, black women in particular, really didn't secure the right until the 1965 Civil Rights Act. And you've, we've seen a lot of things lately about uh, attempts to keep people from voting, which has got to be our purest and most precious uh, reason for all that we do, including dropping the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, we fight for this every day. We need to fight for it. Uh, we need to be able to vote. And so with those thoughts, I want to show you the next slide. As you know, we lost John Lewis this summer. And I want to share with you just some of his words from the essay that he wrote and left to be published in the New York Times on the day of his burial on July 30th. And in part, he says, ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. 
the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. You must also study and learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this soul-wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change. And that is why the answers worked out so long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. Continue to build union between movements stretching across the globe because we must put away our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say, it is your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Truly wise words. So we've seen a lot of destruction here, but with all of this and with the pandemic and so forth, I did want to share with you, there are moments, even though this happened in 2019 before the pandemic, uh, my daughter got married. Uh, so here are some pictures from that day. So we still have these joys. I know Grace's daughter got married in the middle of the pandemic. So as much as we go through these historic times, we still live our daily lives and have those joys as well. Next slide, please. And then I didn't want to be left out of the slides at the beginning. This is, uh, this is our pup Maeve. Uh, she's a German shepherd rescued. Her mom was rescued from Mexico and she has an Irish name. So we have thoroughly confused her. And last, I'd like to leave you with, last slide, please. Uh, I'm stealing this from Fiona Ma, who is our uh, state treasurer. The four W's, wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. We're in this together, even though we're apart. And please welcome and stay safe. Uh, enjoy your students. And we have a lot to look forward to this year. So welcome to 2020, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Burke, especially for giving us that generational perspective of our incoming first year students. And it was a good reminder never to play sports trivia against you. At this time, I'd like to welcome all the new IBC administrators, faculty and staff who have joined the college since August of 2019. Ian Campbell, George Webb, Daphne Lim, Armando Garcia, Marcella Reyes, Donald Tiro, Gloria Delgado, Ace Kagawa, Andrew Pinto, Christian Quintanilla, Anali Gonzalez, Adam Keane, Fabricio Mendola, Jessica Wu Woods, Ann Chow, and Larissa Karempanova. Continuing Sonny Dillon, Kevin Sue, Nick Wilkening, Diana Oshiro, Denise Perez, Monica Perez, Manuel Tapia, Marlo Patterson, Marco Kamal, Allison Dietrich, Stephen Johnson, Richard Faulkner, Takishi Takakuda, Eric Peterson, Emily Pantoja, and our newest member starting on August 24th, uh, Martha McDonald. 
also would like to welcome and introduce IBC administrators and staff who are in new positions or new roles since August of 2019. Scott Kennedy, Phil Romero, Nicholas Naranjo, John Beatty, Amrit Johal, Richard Wagner, Mark Levinson, Eric Kudel, Nick Korotenko, and Aaron Pollard. Congratulations to each of you and, and welcome. In an ideal world, we would have been having this convocation in person. And I certainly would have enjoyed meeting and greeting so many of you, but that unfortunately is not our current reality. However, it was symbolic for me to be present and do this presentation live from IDC as a way to ground me to this wonderful institution and as a way to remind us that there will be a time when we can once again meet face to face. I want to thank so many of you for going beyond and above to help me feel welcomed and I truly am very thankful for that. When speaking with students, I often use the metaphor of writing a story. Sorry, give me a moment. Thank you. I often use a metaphor of writing a story to help them summarize their leadership journey. And I'd like to use the metaphor of writing a story to summarize my leadership journey with you and hopefully provide a glimpse of how my background and experiences have shaped who I am. It is a story that, like yours, is constantly being written, revised, edited, and which grows in length as the years go by and as I encounter new learning experiences, new challenges, disappointments, and achievements. And I am certain that my leadership story will be shaped in the years to come at IBC. American businessman and academic Bill George, author of the classic Discover Your True North, so eloquently stated, leaders are defined by their unique life stories and the way they frame their stories to discover their passions and the purpose of their leadership. As a new member of this community, I look forward to getting to know your story. I recognize the challenge of transitioning to a key leadership role primarily in a virtual environment. As I said, this isn't the norm, but it is our current reality. I certainly don't have experience having done this before. And I'm sure most of us were not trained nor fully prepared to operate a learning institution almost completely in a virtual environment. Instead, I know what has worked well for me in the past. And I understand and value relational leadership, which is a model of shared leadership focusing on developing relational skills, both at the individual level and across teams. And it is grounded in the premise that all team members should grow and develop as leaders, working together interdependently towards a common vision. And so we will have to find creative ways to develop our relational skills with each other for the time being in virtual spaces. I value shared stories and in taking the time to listen and to understand our individual narrative. That's me. Many of you have had the advantage after working together for years, and perhaps others were more reserved and now more than ever miss the human connections. And perhaps some may even wish you had invested more time to connect with others. One reason I place value in this relational aspect of leadership is that in so doing, we find shared experiences. And it is these shared experiences that allow us to find a common connection or bond with one another and often is the basis for what draws us together. So our unique life stories explains in part, as Bill George states, our passions and the purpose of our leadership. 
my family story is an immigrant story that is shared by so many, regardless of the country or location that your families immigrated from. My family immigrated from Cuba to this country when I was seven years old. And like many immigrant students, my parents came here seeking a better life as a way to fulfill their dreams and their aspirations, particularly for their children. Education was seen as a means to achieve economic mobility. And as such, we were encouraged to study hard, to learn, to be good participants in our democracy, and to be thankful for the opportunities we had been provided. Given the era in the late 60s, it was also a story of assimilation, which was not always initiated by us as an expectation of belonging and adapting to our new culture. For example, you may wonder how a Cuban came to be known as John. Well, my birth name is Juan Carlos. I was named after my father and my grandfather but I was always known by my first and middle name. My grandfather was Juan. My father was and is to this day at 90, 90 years old, known as Juanito or Johnny, and I was Juan Carlos. When we enrolled in school, we were automatically given English names. I became John and my sister Raquel became Rachel. By today's standards, this will seem culturally insensitive and offensive, but it was the norm for that time period. Over the years, all of my educational records, including college and university transcripts were under the name of John Carlos. So when I became a citizen at the age of 26, I retained and changed my legal name to John Carlos, which is how I was known by everyone. I grew up in a working class family. My father was a good provider working full time and picking up part-time work to financially provide for his family. My mother, after a short stint working, experienced some health issues and was for the most part, stay-at-home mother who found ways like watching after children to contribute financially. But I learned values that are still important to me and which have shaped my life story. A strong work ethic, the importance of family, faith, and of being proud of my cultural heritage. My parents, with the financial assistance from my grandparents, insisted on my sister and me receiving a private faith-based education. It was a solid educational experience, small class size, strong level of interaction with teachers, all in a college-bound culture. And we know today these are factors that contribute towards propelling students to college, and I recognize the advantage from attending that small private school. During my high school years, I was, believe it or not, for the most part, introverted, quiet. I lacked self-esteem and self-confidence. I was not active in much of anything. Then again, along with my cousins, we cleaned classrooms after school to defray the cost of our tuition and as such, after-school activities were not an option. I had a small circle of friends and I often felt I did not fit in. I now know this was also the struggle to develop my identity and what it meant to be gay in a traditional, heteronormative, religious Latino family and not knowing how to reconcile my truth and living in a closeted world for years to come. But then I experienced college. And as some of you know, I am a product of the California Community College. And I attended Fullerton College right after high school. And that was so, such a transformational time period in my life that looking back, I now know why I feel such a commitment to community college education. But there were two sets of experiences during my college years that in time were to shape and influence me to become more of the person that most people know today. My educational journey was positively shaped as an EOPS student at Fullerton College. As a first year student, I was offered a part-time position as a student ambassador to do outreach at local high schools. In this capacity, I participated in one-on-one -on -one meeting with prospective students to discuss their educational options, provided assistance on financial aid and scholarships, 
as well as other related college going information. Can you imagine a quiet introvert making classroom presentations? Yes, back in the day when we made classroom presentations with chalkboards. However, these experiences allowed me to develop new skills, find confidence, and even skill sets I didn't even know I possessed and challenged me to move outside of my comfort zone. This in time allowed me to develop a passion for providing educational opportunities, particularly to students from historically underrepresented communities. The other involvement opportunity that also occurred during my college years and enhanced what I was already learning about myself as an EOPS ambassador was being active um, at my local church uh, youth ministry. A youth pastor must have seen my potential and approached me about participating in a leadership role. One role led to another position with greater levels of responsibility and over the years allowed me to not only take various leadership roles at my local church, but within the Orange County Federation of Spanish Churches and eventually branching out to Southern California Federation of Churches. And it was during this time period of my life that I learned values that shaped my life story, specifically the importance of mentoring and providing leadership development programs because I firmly believe that leadership principles can be taught and learned. And of course, of creating opportunities for campus engagement and involvement. During my last year in college, I started working full-time as an interim counseling assistant at Fullerton College EOPS. And I'm very proud of my classified staff professional roots. I then started a master's in counseling program with the career goal of becoming a community college counselor because I've been so impacted by such an individual. However, it would take me six years to complete my MS degree because I attended part-time while I worked full-time. The interim position at Fullerton College became permanent and after four years, I moved on as an outreach counselor at Cal State Fullerton where I held two different positions over a nine year career at that institution. And it was as, and, and excuse me, as an assistant dean in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences that I developed an interest in pursuing an administrative career. And by the time I completed my master's degree, I had already shifted my career objective to administration. However, my counseling preparation program allowed me to develop skills that have served me well throughout my career. Given my desire to pursue an administrative path, my mentors advised me to pursue a doctoral degree. And after researching out of state school, I narrowed my scope and began a PhD program in college student personnel administration at University of Maryland College Park as a full-time graduate student. My years at UMCP were transformational for so many reasons, but not the least of which was building my confidence to engage and conduct scholarly research, as well as teaching me the value of becoming a practitioner scholar. My doctoral studies provided a foundation for my work today, namely the role of the environment in shaping educational experiences, the art of administration and organizational leadership, theories of student learning and development, and how to conduct assessment and evaluation and how the results of these should guide our practice and our decision making. My dissertation topic focused on identifying the factors that positively influence the retention of Latino Latina college students. And that interest was shaped by years of working within educational equity programs and wondering why it was that some students succeeded and others did not. This inquiry around student success is something that continues to shape how I view and make sense of student assessment data to improve and adjust practices and pedagogy. This shaped my framework of shifting responsibility for closing achievement gaps from students to us and about individualizing and adjusting our learning environments by addressing academic barriers and then creating solutions and effective intervention strategies. After Maryland, I joined the administration at Santa Ana College, 
is a director of student services and later is an associate dean of student development. From there, I transitioned as an associate vice president and dean of students at Cal Poly Pomona and then to Santiago Canyon College as their vice president for student services for 11 years, followed by a role as interim and permanent president. And so now after being in the field of education for over 30 years, I find myself leading as your recently appointed college president. Becoming a college president was truly not a role I originally aspired to, nor could I ever have imagined as a college student. But I now can see how all of my life experiences, particularly my professional experiences contributed to getting me to this point in time and of course, my story and my leadership journey is still in progress. I began my formative professional career in educational equity programs, recruiting, advising, and creating retention opportunities for first-generation underrepresented or low-income students. And so my commitment to access student success and to make a difference in the lives of students from similar backgrounds was one of the primary factors that led me to this noble profession. As an educator, I have demonstrated a commitment to these values. And as I pursued administrative opportunities, I realized the large scale impact I could make in creating change through policy development, resource allocation, and prioritization of institutional goals. Over the years, I have shaped initiatives and dedicated resources to structure an environment that is inclusive and welcoming of all students. And as a college president, I have supported and led campus equity efforts and created time and space for dialogue around these matters. And it was truly IBC's commitment to student equity, inclusion, and social justice that was in part a primary reason for my wanting to join this dynamic college. So often we forget or take for granted what we've achieved because it may feel as if we have so much more progress to make. And so rather than focusing on what we have yet to achieve before becoming a fully equity centric institution, let us remind ourselves of the good work that has been completed thus far. As a new member of this community, please know I am deeply impressed by the degree and scope of your equity work. I observed and noted it from a distance as a candidate for this position. And now I am learning and viewing it firsthand. And I wanna walk you through some of those examples. Starting with our mission statement that clearly articulates our values and becomes the barometer to measure our work in progress. Our strategic goals, both at the college and district level IBC has four well-defined goals. The first, to ensure equity and access and achievement with seven clearly identified objectives. There's also a strong commitment from our board of trustees. And I'll just give an example in recent resolutions that I believe at the broadest level set a high bar for our commitment and expectations. For example, in May of 2020, a resolution denouncing xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiment. That same month, a resolution articulating an unwavering commitment to student success and equity and a commitment to remove barriers to diversity, equity, and inclusion in our communities and to provide resources to support students and reduce hardships. And most recently in June 2020, a board resolution in support of people of color and condemning acts of police brutality, racial profiling, and use of excessive force and militarized force. At the college level, especially geared towards students, there are so many high impact practices, many outlined in our student equity plan with a strong advocacy for equity and inclusion. I'm so happy that a space was created uh, for an equity and inclusion center, which unfortunately the grand opening was um, held off due to the pandemic. But in terms of student equity programs initiatives, there's the Women of Color Collective, the Men of Color Initiative, 
the dream scholars, the pride scholars that elevate the API, the reentry scholars, the heart scholars, and the guardian scholars. More recently, co hosting healing and racial injustice circles or sessions for students in response to the unjust killing of George Floyd and countless others. Some recent examples of faculty and academic senate led programs include faculty open forum sessions, three recent forums, one focusing on race, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Another screen and convene where the documentary White Like Me was screened. And then the third, an introduction to anti-racist practice, exploring the work of Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And then some examples of campus-wide engagement. The Caring Campus Initiative, where this past year, IBC's classified professionals participated in a series of coaching sessions on the role classified staff play in making students feel welcome and in helping students stay on their educational paths. In fact, I'm gonna make a plug. If you wanna learn more about this initiative, I invite you to participate in the camp, Caring Campus Convocation to be held virtually tomorrow from 8 to 10 a.m. There's also the partnership with USC's Race and Equity Center. And this past spring, a team participated in an institute, and I understand several projects were born out of this work, including developing a college-wide equity certificate of practice program, which will be outlined in more detail tomorrow from 1.30 to 3. And I would be remiss if I didn't give kudos to the Academic Affairs Committee for putting together an impressive array of programs for our 2020 professional development week. I commend you on providing such an array of diverse and relevant sessions and encourage as many faculty, staff, and administrators to take advantage of these activities. Additionally, IBC joined over 60 California community colleges to participate in USC's Equity Leadership Alliance providing critical resources and training to ensure we achieve equity goals, to better understand how to shape campus climate, to learn about recovering from diversity-related crisis, and to foster sustainable cultures of inclusion. Frankly, I could go on and on. Uh, you have a formidable list of accomplishments. My intent was not to provide an exhaustive list, and my apologies if I did not highlight an initiative you have been engaged in. My intent was to remind us of the incredible work that has occurred to date and to validate the individual and collective efforts of so many individuals, departments, and programs, and constituency groups. As a new member to uh, this community, let me say, as I've shared, I am truly impressed at the magnitude of these efforts. However, my initial impression, which I have recently run by several campus leaders in order to validate, is that, that these efforts are not necessarily connected to an overall framework that ties every activity and initiative to a more broad overarching goal. I sincerely appreciate the organic nature from which many of these efforts arose. It appears to be missing is connecting each of these to a broader framework. More specifically, aligning this work to an overall equity framework in order to, one, ensure that this work is grounded in our mission, our strategic plan and objectives. Two, to ensure we are assessing progress and to have a conversation about how will we know what progress looks like. Three, to document and validate when we reach desired benchmarks. And again, that part of the broader conversation of learning how to build incremental uh, sustainable steps. And four, to measure the effectiveness of each and every effort. Otherwise, we run the risk of having dozens of activities that make us feel good that we're engaged in actively pursuing this goal without ever knowing for certain when or if we've succeeded. It is my intent in the coming months to bring together thought leaders and to solicit input from all stakeholders 
and design such a framework within my first year. I know we have the talent, the passion, and the commitment to engage in this work, and I will actively engage and lead this effort to create an overarching equity framework that achieves the above mentioned goals. I also want to take this opportunity to briefly highlight the call to action that was communicated to the field on June 5th, and there was a call to action webinar that I know many of you participated in as a way to challenge our system to actively strategize and take action against structural racism. This call to action is being presented as an additional set of strategies for us to evaluate and as applicable to incorporate into our equity framework. Specifically, it challenges us to mobilize around the following six key areas. The first, as you know, the California Community College System trains the majority of law enforcement officers, firefighters, and EMTs in California. And we have an incredible opportunity as a system to transform our communities by leading the nation and training our law enforcement officers and first responder workforce in unconscious and implicit bias, de-escalation training with cultural sensitivity, and community-oriented demilitarized approaches. While we do not provide such training academies, we do offer an administrative of justice program that prepares students for employment in various agencies. And we can also work with our campus police department leadership to assess onboarding training, professional development, and department policies and procedures that are consistent with the overarching goal of this key area. Secondly, it is important that we host open dialogue and to address issues of campus climate. Frankly, I feel that for many, um, especially a lot of, of young people, this, the murder of George Floyd triggered an awakening and a catalyst to recognize that this was not an isolated incident. And so we truly now more than ever have an opportunity because we cannot influence the broader society, either at the state or federal level. But as a microcosm of that society, we can certainly shape our sphere of influence at Irvine Valley College and have open and honest conversations about how we come together to keep building inclusive and safe learning environments. I truly look forward to learning how IBC has used assessment tools to better understand the experience of students, faculty, and staff. As a matter of fact, our participation in the USC Equity Leadership Alliance provides access to three campus climate surveys. The center is developing a pair of workforce climate surveys, one for staff at all levels, another for faculty, including adjunct and part-time instructors, and a third student survey. The third, the third key area in the call to action has a place for faculty campus leaders to join in engaging in a comprehensive review of course and programs. Faculty certainly have um, an opportunity to engage and develop action plans to provide a proactive support in evaluating the classroom and learning cultures, whether it's examining inclusive curriculum, uh, evaluating courses for diversity of representation and culturally relevant content. And of course, it should include and involve adjunct faculty in this work. Four, we have a unique opportunity for governing boards and educational leaders to re-familiarize ourselves with college equity plans and critically review them to assess if these plans were designed for compliance or were they designed for outcomes. And it's another example of how we can have conversations about the limitations and barriers to pushing our equity plans and agenda further and identify where we can scale up and accelerate this work. Five, in 2018, the Board of Governors mandated that our system create a plan to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workforce and learning environments. So this particular item calls us to review the recommendations that came out of that plan and to mobilize and implement all tier one recommendations in the next six to 12 months. And then six, 
to uh, engage in a vision resource center that has been created as a virtual community of learners where colleagues can serve as an excellent resource to share the good work being accomplished in the 116 community colonies. Again, this call to action provides additional context in designing IBC's equity framework. But this work cannot be sustained by a select few, nor is it the responsibility of a designated department or division. As president, I recognize my role in leading, guiding, and prioritizing these efforts and creating time and space for this work. However, it will require that all of us actively engage, particularly those in leadership roles. It's going to be hard work, but transforming an institutional culture has never been simple. It can and probably will be messy. It will make us feel uncomfortable and will often push us outside of our comfort zones. And it will require us to have the courage to engage in difficult conversations and to ask, how are we using our positions of influence, privilege, and power to make a difference? I'm inviting you in the coming year to actively participate by listening, learning, and taking action as we create safe space for this ongoing dialogue. There is still time to shape our college's narrative using my metaphor from the beginning. And there is time to shape what we want it to say. After all, we are the authors of our college's story. So let us seize that opportunity. I began this opening by stating that leadership is a journey. My partner Derek took this photo in Zion National Park early June as we were walking to one of the hiking trails and I had not yet developed the framework for this presentation and yet this photo depicts so well my journey, our journey, and the road ahead for us. I see a future where we continue to provide and restore hope. I envision a future where disparities in student success measures are eliminated and where we can continue to meet students where they are. I believe we will build a future that strengthens our improvement efforts so that every student's experience is designed for success. I see a future with design pathways to provide clear and coherent educational experiences for our students. A future where we restore justice to unjust systems. And I see a future where we have an evolved set of college system structures and cultural features that ensures all students will achieve their educational goals at equitable rates. We all have a role in shaping this future. Our work directly influences that responsibility, no matter what title or position you have within this college. As we conclude today's presentation, I realize that many of you have questions perhaps about how we have and continue to provide instructional support to faculty and students, or how we're equipping staff with the proper tools to be effective working remotely. Others may be anxious to know more about how we're planning for an eventual re-entry. Please know that in the coming weeks, I hope to convene several virtual town halls to address topics of interest that were not covered in my opening session. I also would be remiss if I did not thank several individuals that were key in putting together this virtual convocation, including Melanie Butner, Jeff Hyland, Tim Van Norman, and Sandy Jeffries. Thank you so much. I, there's no way this would have happened without them. In her memoir, My Beloved World, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor shares how she overcame many challenges in her life, including poverty, a chronic illness, being raised by a single mother. She states that experience has taught her to not value dreams according to the odds of their coming true. Let me say that again. Experience taught her 
not to value dreams according to the odds of their coming true, but rather that their true value is in stirring within us the will to aspire. And so I want to leave you today with this quote. After a time, you may recognize that the proper measure of success is not how much you close the distance to a far off goal, but the quality of what you've done today. So I want to thank you all for, in a virtual environment, joining me and by extension, welcoming me. This concludes IDC's opening day presentation. And it's the kickoff of our professional development week. So I want to wish you best wishes for a successful semester. And I sincerely thank you.